I'm still talking about kings and priests. I'm going to be on this for a long time because there's so much in this process of growing up into spiritual priesthood and then moving into spiritual authority in a deeper way, in a greater way. And this is important. We need to understand and remember that uh, I talked to you about positional truth and experiential truth. And, and, and uh, like the word becoming flesh, you know, Jesus was Jesus before he was born, but he was Jesus in the heavens. He was eternal in the heavens and he even appeared in, that, in, in, in certain times in the Old Testament. But he didn't become Jesus as a baby until he was born and he didn't experience human life until he was born. So there was positional, he knows all things. All things are, are, are held together by him, but experientially, he experienced life, just as we do, by being born. We need to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. In other words, we have to understand what's spiritual and what is literal. Some things are literal, some things are spiritual. When the Bible talks in Revelation about the, these giant things coming up out of the earth, they got stingers and hair like women, and they got shields and stuff like that. That's a spiritual illustration. It's not a literal thing. We're not going to see literally things come out of the earth with these giant tails and stingers and hair like women. What I guess it would have to be like your hair. Yes, you know. And, uh, but that's, not, that's, that's spiritual. Okay, those are pictures. So we need to understand those things. In, our, in, in the process of our maturity, our growth, positional truth speaks to our eternal standing in Christ. In Christ... We have all things. In Christ, we know all things. In Christ, it's only in Him. On our own, we're growing into it. A tree is in an acorn. Positionally. Experientially, if it's not planted, it will never grow. Positionally, it's, it's already done inside. The blueprint is there. The plan is there. Everything is there. But then experientially, it needs to be uh, put in the earth. It needs water. It needs rain. It needs sunlight. And then it begins to grow. Wind will shift it and make it lean one way. Sunlight will, will shift it and make it lean towards the sun. These are experiences that change the positional aspect. So there is a truth inside of us that God's already done things in us, but experientially will shape us as to how we'll live it out. We need to understand those things. God's plan for mankind is progressive. And experiential truth deals with the progressive plan of God for our lives and for the earth and, in fact, for the universe. Prophetic timing is the key to understanding. And I used this when I talked about Gideon and the 300, when they had the trumpets, and they had to blow the trumpets at the right time. It had to be done exactly at the right moment, otherwise the effect wouldn't have been uh, been as great as it was. And so that's the prophetic timing, the timing of God takes place in this. And I gave you an example, of course, about God giving the promised land to Israel. First, he promised it to Abraham, and then he promised it to Isaac and then to Jacob, and then he said to Moses, this is the land I'm bringing and I'm going to give to the people. And then he brought to Joshua and said to Joshua, now is the time you're going to cross over. On the third day, you're going to cross over the Jordan River, and you're going to take the land. Well, on the third day they crossed over, they didn't take anything. They took a break. And then they were circumcised. And then they had to get healed. And then they came against Jericho. So timing and experience shapes positional truth. God gave it to them, but then I shared with you the word yarash in Hebrew, which means inheritance. It's, it's translated inheritance. Now, when my parents, when, when my, my dad had passed away, he left some inheritance that was distributed to all of his children. And then when my mom passed, she actually had something and she left an inheritance distributed to all. We didn't have to do anything to get that. We were children, we got it. If you didn't get it, it's because you weren't a child. Your grandchild didn't count. So we got that, that was free and it was given to us. It was an inheritance. But there's another word for inheritance. It's the word yarash and it means to take possession of by driving out the inhabitants of the land. So God says, I give you the land for your inheritance. The only thing is, experientially, you've got to go and fight for it. You're going to have to conquer it. And if you don't conquer it, if you don't take it, any tribe that you leave, any Midianites, Amorites, Hittites, Jebusites, all these differentites, 
Anyone you don't defeat and don't take the land from, they will forever be thorns in your side and like stickers in your eyes. And guess who's still there in Israel today as thorns in their sides and stickers in their eyes? Those who are descendants of the tribes that were not taken. So God wants us to do things. We need to positionally, he gave them the land. Experientially, they had to take it. So that's how it is with us also. And I talked to you about Matthew, the, 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 the apostle Matthew, when he wrote in the Bible, in Matthew eleven twelve, he used two specific Greek words to talk about entering into the kingdom of God. And when you don't understand it, when you first read it, you think it the wrong way. One verse says it this way, the kingdom of heaven is suffering violence, and the violent take it by force. Well, it's a, it's a true translation, but it doesn't make sense to us. What it sounds like is that the enemy is coming against the kingdom of heaven and taking it. The kingdom of heaven is suffering violence. Well, you know, it's being attacked. No, but that's not it. See, the better translation says this way, that the kingdom of heaven is being preached and everyone is pressing into it and eagerly seizing it by force. In other words, it's there, it's yours, but there are obstacles in the way. You have to press in, you have to press through, and then when you get it, you eagerly seize it. And you take it, even if forcefully. Because if the enemy has your kingdom, if the enemy has your possessions, if the enemy, listen mom, if the enemy's got your child, you're gonna seize the child back. So we're taking back what was lost by Adam. And so he uses these two words, biazo and harpezo. It's not that important that you remember them. What's important is that you remember that in order to enter into the kingdom of God, you've got to force your way in and then take a hold of it eagerly. Hold on to it. And don't let anybody take it away from you. We're in a spiritual war, and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. So we're not fighting people. We're never fighting people. We're fighting what's behind it, what's driving them, what's, what's forcing them to go that way, what's making them act towards you the way they act towards you. It's not them only. That's why Jesus, when, he, when Jesus said this, if it's not true, he couldn't have said it. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You see, even when people know what they're doing, they don't know what they're doing. Because they're not doing it of their own volition. They're being driven to do it. They're being compelled to do it. Spiritual things, darkness, the rulers of darkness, demons, whatever it may be, are pushing them and shoving them and making them go that way and convincing them it's the right way. But they don't know what they're doing. If they had the light shining on them, they'd know it was wrong. So we have to understand that. People are never our enemies. So now, we need to understand that God has given us spiritual weapons, and the one I've been talking about mostly is the weapon of worship. The Bible says in John, the Father is seeking those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth, according to what the Spirit of God is and the Spirit inside of you and the truth of the Word of God. Now, what does it mean if He's seeking that? Do you seek for things that are right in front of you? No, you just take them. You have to seek for things you can't find quickly. So out of the millions of Christians around the world, God is still seeking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Because most Christians don't. Most Christians don't because they've never learned how. They think that singing songs on Sunday is just to make a joyful noise to the Lord and get ready for the preacher to preach. Get everybody awake. And, now, and they'll say it. We'll say it all the time. Let's do, a, let's do a fast song. Let's wake them up. You need to wake up on your way to church. You need to get ready before you walk in the door. When you're walking up the street or when you're getting out of the car and you're coming up the steps, you've got to be ascending into his presence. You've got to treat the house of God as a sanctuary. A special place amen? amen and you've got to be prepared so he wants us to understand something today Edgar is confessing last night I wasn't gonna press in tomorrow I wasn't gonna eagerly take what God has for me and seize it I was tired I was beaten down I was depressed I was going through things and I wasn't gonna do that I wasn't gonna press in but something helped him press in today maybe it was his wife I don't know 
Maybe she looked at him in the morning and smacked him a few times and said, get up, get up, I'm not driving to church, you're driving us. I don't know. Maybe it was just the Spirit of God himself talking and saying, you need to come, son. You need to be here today. Because God knew what was going to happen. You see, Miguel's not here by accident. He's here because it's raining. Bad weather. He can't be out on the boat, can't be fishing. Had charters, things to do. But God sent him here. God sent him here for what? To give Edgar a word. But if Edgar did not press in and seize the opportunity to take something today, he would have missed it and lost it. Positionally, God had it set. The weather was right. Miguel was here. It's all positionally set. Experientially, Edgar had to press in. He had to take it. Come on, somebody. Say amen. Those of you at home, you're missing it. You're just plain missing it. Yes, you're getting blessed. Yes, you feel good. Yes, the presence of God is there. But you're missing something special by not being here. Now, those of you that are home and can't be here, like the Olowskis down in West Virginia, we know you can't be here. So let's say hello to them. Amen. Give God, yeah. God for them. We know you're members of the church, but you can't be here. And so we're going to bless the Lord together with you and pray that God send to you what you need. But those of you who are just cooking in that pot like a frog, we're not sending anything to you except a warning. Wake up. Get up out of bed. Get out of your pajamas. Put that pancake down. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And don't think I'm mad at you. You know, it's like some people walk away. Oh, you, did you hear the way Bishop was talking? He's mad at us for not coming to church. I'm not mad at you. I feel sorry that you're not here. I want you to be here so we can enjoy and enjoy this together. Amen. Amen. And praise God. Amen. I know sometimes I don't come across that way, but that's the way I feel. Amen. So the weapon of praise is the one I've been talking about because it's with praising and worshiping God. It's through music. It's through instruments. It's through song. These are the things that we're using as a spiritual weapon. Music, we know, changes the atmosphere. If you're in a place, a romantic place, and you're on a date, you've got a candlelight, you've got a little bottle of wine, and you've got a nice appetizer, and the next thing you know, they put on like an ACDC, bat out of hell or something like that. You're not going to be too happy because it changed the whole atmosphere. Music changes atmosphere. And that's why music is so important. We have to understand that. The weapon of praise is what gives us access to possess the land. God has so much that he's promised us. So let's look. We, look, we looked a little bit at Jesus' death and resurrection and how through his death, taking sin upon himself, actually becoming a sinner just like us, but took the guilt of everything. Because, you know, people blame God all the time. Why did God do this? How come God did that? I don't love God for this. And God... I'm taking the blame. No excuses. I'm taking the blame. I'm going to take the punishment. And he did. And by doing that, he was obedient to himself. To his own nature, he was obedient. It was, it, it was so hard for Jesus. He sweat blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. As he, it's not that he was afraid of the cross. He, he basically, he's, I can handle the, the crucifixion part. It's the sin part. Knowing I'm going to be separated from you. Knowing, Father, I will be separated from you. And I, if you don't do what you said you do, I will be lost forever. That was the torment that he was going through. And then he said, oh, but thou art holy. Psalm 22. If you read Psalm 22, it is the And then it becomes the resurrection. Psalm 22, I think it's verse 22, it says, Yet thou art holy, thou who inhabits the praises of Israel. Jesus goes from suffering. He says, they pierced my hands and my feet. I can see my bones. My mouth is dry like a potsherd, dried up. They give me vinegar and, and gall to drink. And they, they cast lots for my garments. All these things are in Psalm 22. They all happened. And in the midst of the suffering, he says, but you are holy. Holy. Somebody say it. Holy. holy. Come on, bring the presence holy. of God. Holy. Holy, O oh Lord. Oh, God, heaven and earth must become full of your glory. And he died. Somebody was asking the other day, I think it was Dale. Yeah, she was, she's got a, her license plate says, Holy Roar. 
She liked the way it sounded, holy roar. And somebody said to her, what's that mean? She was having a hard time explaining it. So I said, remember when Jesus was crucified, he went to the cross as the Lamb of God, as a sacrifice for sin. But when he died, no man took his life. The Bible says, and with a loud cry, he gave up his spirit. And that word really should be translated with a loud roar like a lion. Amen. He gave up his spirit. That's the Holy Spirit roar she videoed me when I was telling <laughs> I was driving in the car and she's in the back seat she's videoing that's good I like that now I know what to say to people but that's what happened he, d he went to the cross as the lamb but when he died no man took his life with a roar like a lion the lion of Judah roared hallelujah and when he roared the earth quaked the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom an impossible thing yes. because the lion roared hallelujah yeah, yeah. hallelujah yeah. amen yeah. let's go a little deeper into some of these things today Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 if you got that Genesis 2 verse 7 and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul I forget who said it I, I maybe it was last week or whatever Man, God had to get real close to Adam to breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. You don't do it from a distance. You're not up there in heaven and say, there's the breath of life down there. No, he, right, that was face to face. Was that you, Yaz? Yes. It was you. Yeah, I knew. I knew somebody here said it. Right, I mean, right there in his face, like mouth to mouth. Boom. You know? He breathed into him the breath of life. And I want to point out that the word life is mistranslated. It should be lives because in Hebrew, it's a plural word. He breathed into him the breath of lives. He gave him life in his spirit, and he gave him life in his body. He had two lives, spiritual and physical. Adam was made of two parts. Adam is made, see, there, there, there's, a, there's an error. There's a doctrine that's been around for quite a while. It's been really pushed in the last several years, last 20, 30 years, it's been pushed. There's an error, and it says that man is a spirit, he has a soul and lives in a body. Sounds nice, but it's not what the Word of God says. If you just read me Genesis 2, 7 again, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives, and man became a living soul. He didn't become a spirit with a soul in a body. He became a living soul. So we are not a spirit. We are a soul. Now you say we have soul. Well, you got soul when you got music. You know, you got to have soul. You know, and that's the problem. Because so much of our whole culture and our life is all built around something about having soul. We think that we've got a soul. We don't have a soul. We are a soul. You are a soul. You know, your soul, it, it's, that's the thinking aspect. That's the reasoning. That's the mind. And that's what has to be changed. The Bible says, renew your mind. Renew your soul. Renew it now. Make it new. Your spirit is born again. Your body's going to be resurrected. Work on the connector. It's the thing that connects the two. Your soul, you, is what connects your body and your spirit. And your mind is what you use to reason these things out. God is doing something in our lives with that. I want to give you a little, a little example. This might sound funny, but one day God decided to make a candy. He wanted to make a candy that was hard on the outside, but soft on the inside. So he did, and he called it living soul. That's you. You're the candy. That hard thing on the outside, that's your physical body. That soft thing on the inside, that's your spirit. And what are you? You are not half a spirit, half a... You are, it's all one. You are a living soul. And if you understand that, you'll see more and more what God is doing in our lives. Amen? Amen. So we don't possess a soul. We are a soul. When somebody says, have you got soul? Say, baby, I am a soul. I am soul personified. Now, God gave Adam a spirit so he could walk with him, talk with him in spiritual ways, in heavenly wells, ways. He gave him a body so he could physically walk with him also and talk with him also. Now, when God walked with Adam in the cool of the day, how did Adam know he was around? He heard the voice Lord God walking in the garden. How does a voice walk? 
Well, the voice of the Lord is Jesus. And he heard Jesus, the voice of the Lord God, walking in the garden, calling him, Adam, where are you? Now, here I am, Lord. And they walked together. They talked together. And they talked about spiritual things. They talked about heavenly things. They talked about the universe. They talked about the stars. They talked about Orion. They talked about Pleiades. They talked about the Milky Way. They talked about Pluto and uh, planets. They talked about all, you know, he talked about all these things with him. We're not told how long God was with Adam walking with him and talking with him until he made Eve. But I think he took a while to hang out with him first because he knew once he gave him his wife, he's going to lose a little bit of him. He's going to lose some of his attention. Adam, where are you? I'm, I'm, I'm helping my wife. Well, come on. I'll be there in a minute. And that's life. So he knew, I need to give him everything I can give him now. I've got to spend time with him now. So he gave him a body, and he gave him a spirit. And then he could meet with him and talk with him in both realms. Paul says this. We are going to have a heavenly body one day. Angels are different than people. Angels have a heavenly body, okay? They're different than us. When, when Adam was in the Garden of Eden, not only would God walk with him, but angels could come and walk with him and talk with him and talk about things, explain things, show them different things, and, 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 and do these things there because they also could walk. Although their bodies were different, they're called celestial bodies or heavenly bodies, they're still, in a sense, a substance. They're not just a spirit. They are substance. They have a form and a shape. It's just like we do. Ours is earthly. Theirs is heavenly. And Paul says, one day you will have a heavenly body also. That's what the resurrection is about. 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 1. This we know, that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, so he talks about like a tent. He says, when this tent is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself, not made by human hands. In, the, in other words, not made through procreation. We grow weary in our present bodies, and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. We will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. So we're going to have a body one day. Ladies, one day you will have a heavenly body. You may not think your, your body's heavenly now, but one day you'll have a heavenly body. Men, one day that what used to be a six-pack and now is a keg, you will have a heavenly body also. <laughs> Amen? So God is going to change us. He's going to do things. We're going to be clothed upon with a new body. And we're going to be like the angels because they have celestial bodies now. They have that now. You know, some people think that angels, all angels, are flying around with wings and stuff like that. No, there's only two types of angels that have wings in the Bible, seraphim and cherubim. They're the only two that we know have wings. All the rest, they look just like us. How do we know that? Let's look at Genesis chapter 18. I'm going someplace with this, so try to stay with me, okay? Genesis chapter 18. I'm going to read the New American Standard Version. Now, the Lord appeared to Abram by the Oaks of Mamre. Mamre was a guy who owned the property before. Now Abraham owned it, so they still called it the Oaks of Mamre. Okay, it's like the park. He was there by the Oaks of Mamre. He was sitting in his tent door in the heat of the day, and when he lifted up his eyes and he looked, behold, there were three men standing in front of him. Yes. Hello? Yes. Three who? Three, three men. Yes. Why did they call them men? This is the Bible. This is the Word of God. Is it true? Yes. Three men. Why? Because they looked just like men. Now, Abraham knew one of them was the Lord. Why? He'd already seen the Lord. The Lord had appeared to him when he was back in Ur of the Chaldees, back in Babylon's area. And he appeared to him and he said to him, I am the Lord, and I want you to go to the promised land. And Abraham already knew. So when he saw him standing, this is what he did. He says, when he lifted his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them. He bowed himself to the earth and he said, my Lord... He was not bowing to the angels. He was bowing to the Lord. He said, my Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, yes. please don't pass me by. Yes. Amen. Let a little water be brought to wash your feet. Rest under the tree. I'll bring some bread that you can refresh yourselves so that you can then go on after you visit your servant. And they said, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried to the tent and he told Sarah, Sarah, the Lord's here. He's got two, two guests with him. Go quickly. Get three measures of flour. One for the father, 
One for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. But of course, it was just two angels. Anyway, anyway, uh, three measures of flour. Knead it, make bread cakes. Abraham ran to the herd. He got a choice calf. He gave it to his servant. He said, quick, prepare this. And so the servant prepared it. And, and, and they took the bread Sarah made and the, and the, and the, uh, the meal that the servant prepared. And they brought it out. And it says, and he took curds and milk and the calf which had been prepared. He placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. That was the servant that was standing there. You've got to understand the pronouns and the adjectives and stuff. So the servant came and brought it, and he stood under the tree as a waiter waiting because Abraham and the Lord and two angels were sitting together having a meal. How could angels eat a meal if they haven't got a body? Otherwise, it would be like, you know, casting a friendly ghost, drinking water, and it squirts out somewhere else, you know, because he's a spirit. And he, you know, but they're not spirits. Angels are not spirits. They are living beings. In fact, better translations say in the book of Revelation, where it says in some places, and the creature, it says the living being. Okay? So they are absolutely, they look like men. Now, in the next chapter, they go to Sodom and Gomorrah, and in that chapter, they're called angels. They were on a mission. They were messengers on a mission of God. But they all sat down and enjoyed a meal together. This is why God gave Adam a, a physical life and a spiritual life so that he could have fellowship in both realms with him. And now we are changed. Our spirit, which was dead when we're born, every child born in this world is born dead because of sin. Spiritually dead. Physically alive. Spiritually dead. And so there's an answer for that. Adam had fellowship with God in both realms, and now God has given us the ability to have fellowship with him in both realms again. Amen. Now, remember something else. Adam and Eve were naked, it says, after they sinned. It's not talking about clothing. Because the Bible says that they discovered they were naked. Well, I think they knew the day before if they were naked that they were naked physically. But they were naked of something else, naked of what we call Shekinah. Shekinah was a covering. It was something that they had upon them so that when God came to them, they could fellowship with God. Our God is a consuming fire. Who has seen God and lived? So they had to have something. A welder has to put a mask over his face so that, and, and when he passed over his face, you can't see anything, basically, until you strike the torch, and then the bright light of the welding will give you sight to see. He has to have a covering to protect him from the blinding light. And, we, and, and Adam and Eve had Shekinah protecting them. God has given us Shekinah back. Yes. We are now, again, we can be covered by the Shekinah of God. So we can be in his presence and not be consumed and not go blind. Not spiritually uh, in these different things. God has given us the breath of lives. He said to Adam also, he said, You shall eat of all the things in the Garden of Eden, except don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat of it you shall die. But in the Hebrew again, the word die is plural. It, says, it should say, you shall die two deaths. One spiritually happened immediately. When they sinned, they were naked. Immediately, the spirit was dead. So they sewed fig leaves together and covered themselves up to try to make a covering because the Shekinah was gone. Their spirit died. Their bodies didn't die for hundreds of years, but they were positionally dead. Experientially, they died immediately spiritually. And that's why death has been passed on to every human being. Every human being is born physically alive and spiritually dead. So we have to have something happen or else we cannot fellowship with God. God gave them the breath of life and now they had the breath of lives and now they experienced spiritual death and then later physical death. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 because it's important that we understand what God is doing here in our lives. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 it says, And you hath he quickened, who's he? Jesus. And you hath Jesus quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Spiritually dead, not physically dead, spiritually dead. And you hath he quickened. That's the name of this message today, quickened. 
Quicken means to be made alive in our spirit. Resuscitation. It's as if when God breathed into Adam the breath of lives in his nostrils, in one nostril, I know this is silly, in one nostril physical life came in, in the other nostril spiritual life came in. And you had to quicken because you were still physically alive, but he had to breathe into you again the breath of life into your spirit so your spirit could come alive. A resuscitation. Just when somebody dies and they mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and then using CPR, pushing the heart, pumping the lungs, getting the heart to be pushed, and then breath being forced in, and then God, thanks God, sometimes people come back from the dead. They're dead. But then they're brought back. We were spiritually dead, but now we're alive. We've been quickened by God. Amen. Let's look at some of the ways that people were quickened back in the Bible, okay? Because we're going to understand how we're quickened. In, in John chapter 20, verse 21 and 22, the Bible says that after Jesus rose from the dead, they were assembled in the upper room, yes, yes. shaken in their boots, because they were afraid that the Romans and the Jews, the Pharisees, were going to come and take them away. And Jesus, it says, appeared in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be unto you. Yes. Hallelujah. Peace be unto us. He said, Peace Woo. be unto you. Thank you Lord. As my Father sent me, I send you. And when he said this, yes. he breathed on them. Yes. And he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit went in, they were resuscitated on the inside. Yes. That dead spirit came alive. They had never been alive spiritually. They had felt the anointing on their bodies. They felt the anointing in their soul, in their life, in their, in their feelings. But they were never alive. But when he breathed on them, and I don't know if he breathed on them in general, or if he went to each one and breathed on each one. Now there's a lot of monkey business going on with breathing on people. Well, the Holy Ghost is here. And everybody falls down. Hello? This is like children playing church. God doesn't play games with the Holy Spirit. I don't see Jesus saying, everybody over there. And then they all fall down. Just a little aside over here for a second. Let's get, let's get serious about the Holy Spirit and how he moves and works. And, and I, it's true that, yes, sometimes you'll, you'll receive the power of God. It'll fall down. It happens. And God is raising us up to make us not be children, but to be men and women. So that when he breathes on us and when he touches us, we can receive that. Yes, sometimes we'll fall, but then we get up. And then the next time we have it and we receive it and we stand longer. Yes, we'll still shake and fall. Things happen, but we're growing in our ability to contain the Holy Spirit inside of us. So they were quickened when Jesus breathed on them. Others in Acts chapter 2. Some of you remember the book of Acts chapter 2. When it says, in the fullness of time, at the right moment, prophetic timing, God came, the Holy Spirit came to them as what? The sound of a rushing mighty wind came into the upper room. Now there's 120 up there. There were others who were there in the upper room that had not been in that place when Jesus walked in. And the disciples were there, when the apostles were there. There were 11 of them there. But now there's 120. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is there. Mary is there also who had uh, anointed his feet and washed his feet with her tears and her hair. And then when that happened, it tells us that the day of Pentecost was come, the wind came in, and then fire came and fell upon each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So they were quickened. When the Spirit came upon them, when the wind blew and the fire fell, they were quickened. They were made alive. They were born again. So Pentecost is the birthing of the church. Because from Pentecost Sunday, when the Holy Spirit fell, they didn't stay in the upper room, but they went out into the world. And 3,000 got saved that day. 3,000 pilgrims who were in Jerusalem because of the holiday, the feast of Pentecost, they were saved. And what happened with them? Acts chapter 2, verse 37, 38, and 39. Peter preached a message, and he said, This is what's happening. Jesus is here, and he's alive, and what you see and what you hear is now the moving of God and the Holy Spirit. And then he says, And they said, What shall we do? He said, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. For the promise is to you and all that are far off. So the Holy Spirit comes to people also, not just in fire, not just in breath, 
but comes to them in simple faith. Simple confession. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe he's the Savior of the world. I believe he's the Son of God. I believe that he rose from the dead, and I believe he's coming again. I'm made alive spiritually. Holy Spirit comes inside. Every born-again believer has the Holy Spirit now residing within. There are people who call themselves Christians because they say they believe, but they have mental belief. They have not got the gift of faith in their heart. They are Christians in name only. They're not born again. Saying a prayer just by saying, Lord, forgive me of my sins and make me uh, saved and die and go to heaven. That's not what makes you a born again Christian. It's when you believe in your heart and you confess it with your mouth. Just reciting something doesn't make it happen. I can get a parrot to say, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Doesn't make him born again. So when people say that they're a Christian, but they've never experienced the Holy Spirit coming into their life because they have not yet received that gift of faith, they are Christians in name only. And the promise is for them, and they can receive it. But something has to happen for them to go from believing here in their head to believing here in their spirit, in their soul. Amen. So we need to understand that and understand that not everybody who says I'm a Christian is really a Christian. Christians in name only. A born-again Christian is different. You know if you're born again because you know you're different. You know something happened to you. You know something changed when you accepted Christ as your Savior. You know, you're, you felt that your sins were washed away. And now, if you haven't been baptized, you're ready to say, I want to be baptized in His name also, so that my sins can be washed away in the, in the, in the waters of baptism. I feel that they've been taken away from my, my soul, but I, I need them washed away. And you're ready for that. Amen. And when that happens, you know it on the inside, and you know, I'm different, I'm changed. It's not just, did you say the prayer? Yeah, I said the prayer. I hope it works. That's not it. Am I making sense? You understand? Yes. So there are some people, and some may be listening today or watching today, who are saying, well, I thought I was a Christian. I, I thought that I got born again when I just said that prayer that day. Maybe what happened is you took the first step to getting closer to God. Maybe today is the day to say, Lord, I don't want to just think in my mind that Jesus is real. I want to know it. I want to experience it. I want to feel it. I want to have it within me. I want the Holy Spirit in my life. You see, if you've been going through the motions and you're trying and you're trying, but it's not happening, you need the Holy Spirit in your life. Yes. You need to be quickened, yes. made alive. Yes. You need something to happen. If you need that, right, I'm going to pray a prayer right now. Yes. Maybe there's somebody right here. Maybe there's somebody in watching. Let's just pray right now together. Father, in Jesus' name. Lord God, you may have those who have wanted to be born again, but somehow they have not received it. They, they're trying. They're coming to church. They're, they're reading the Bible. They're doing things. But deep on the inside, they know there's still an emptiness there. That's because the Spirit is not there yet. With their minds, they're serving you. But they want to serve you with their heart, with all their soul, all their strength. And in Jesus' name, Father, I ask you, breathe again from heaven. Mm. By simple faith, the gift of faith to come into their life right now to receive the Holy Spirit and let their dead spirit, the candle of the Lord, let it come on fire. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The reason why the Holy Spirit came as fire on Pentecost is because the Bible tells us that the Spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. This candle is in the church, but it's not lit. There are many people who are in the church, but they're not lit. So the Spirit came as fire to light them so that now they're born again. I just want to do this. Oh Lord, I'm a sinner. The candle's talking. I'm a sinner. I know that I'm not saved. I'm trying to be saved. I've tried to believe in you. But I need the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Breathe upon me. And give me life. And like a fire he comes. And he lights the spirit, which means now it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. 
Another one says, there's something missing inside of me. I see it in her. I see something different in her. I want it to, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Don't be surprised if you speak in other tongues or begin to speak about the wonderful things of God when that happens. Amen? Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Those of you watching right now, are you ready? Amen. You can receive it right now. Eternal life, the Spirit of God. It's for all of you, every one of us. The Spirit is here. Amen? Amen. Quicken. Made alive. We are different. We are changed. Every human being outside of Christ is dead spiritually. Now, many of them are in touch with the spiritual world because they know the spiritual world is real. You see them all over the place. Every highway you go down, there's a hand. Psychic. I'm in touch with the spiritual world. Right? A lot of that stuff is out there because the spiritual world is real. But when you have the Holy Spirit, you begin to realize that's not the real spirit. I've got the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. So now you're alive in the name of Jesus. Adam was made a living soul. Guess what Jesus was when he was born in this world? A living soul. Adam was alive physically and spiritually. Guess what Jesus was when he was born into this world? Alive spiritually and physically. Jesus was the first person born born again in a sense because he was alive spiritually Adam was created and then he received the breath of lives and he became alive physically and spiritually Jesus was born into this world and when he came in this world he came in with his spirit on fire he was alive he was so alive that when Mary went to visit Elizabeth her cousin who was six months pregnant with John the Baptist who had not been moving in the womb. And Mary greeted her cousin and said, Greetings, Elizabeth. Elizabeth said, oh, oh my God. The moment you said that to me, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And the Bible says, And John was filled with the Spirit from his birth. The Spirit of God was upon him right from the very beginning. Because Jesus is the giver of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Jesus was born. Adam was created without sin. Jesus was born without sin. We were, we were born with sin. So our soul is corrupted. Our minds, our feelings, our thoughts, our memories are corrupt. Didn't you ever read, you are what you eat? Physically, that's talking about, right? Your body is composed of what you eat. You eat a lot of hot dogs till you start to look like one, right? <laughs> But you are what you eat. You know, spiritually, you are what you eat spiritually. If you feed yourself with junk doctrines and false doctrines and stuff, you're going to be junk spiritually. You are what you eat spiritually. We need the Spirit of God to keep us alive. We were born in sin. Our soul is corrupt. We need to wash our soul. The Bible says wash yourself with the water of the Word of God. I think all of us now wash our hands more than we ever did in our lives. You walk in the house, you wash your hands. You need to get to realize when you walk out of here today or when you stop watching this today or whatever and you go back out in the world and you do stuff, pollution is coming on you, sin is coming on you, dirt's coming on you, spiritual stuff is happening. You need to get to the Word of God and get washed again and renew your thinking, renew your mind, renew your soul. That's why we talk about the salvation of our soul. It's not that it's a separate part. It's us. There's a full salvation that God has for us. Adam sinned and died the deaths. Spiritually death, right away. Physically death, hundreds of years later. Jesus rose from the dead and became a life-giving spirit. He changed. Something happened. Now he's the giver of life to give to life to us. And he gives it to John 1, verse 12, all who believe in his name, he's the Messiah, Savior. Jesus means Savior. Yehoshua, Savior. When you believe he's your Savior, you become a child of God. You are born again. You receive the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us just like we bore the image of the earthly, we look like Adam, one day we will look like Jesus. 
Now it's already in it's already in this acorn. It's already here inside, but it's going to come out later on. The Bible says that when we see him, we'll be like him. We're going to all of a sudden grow. Some of this is ours now. Some of it's ours later. We need to understand what's ours now and what's ours later. What promises for us now and what promises us for later on? There are people promising, constantly promising, every single person I pray for will be healed. Well, excuse me. That's not the word of God. There's no place in the word of God that says every single person who gets prayed for gets healed. It doesn't promise that. It says if you're sick, pray. If you're sick, call for the elders. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. It doesn't always mean it's going to save them by bringing them physical healing. Sometimes it just saves them by giving them peace of mind to know I can leave this world okay. That's salvation also. So we need to be careful. We need to divide the word of truth so we don't get caught up with false doctrines. Do you know how many people have believed that they're going to get healed the moment they get prayed for? And they didn't get healed, and they went back again, and went back again, and went back again, and, went back, and they stopped going. And now they don't believe. Had they been told the truth, maybe they'd still be believing. But they've fallen away because they were promised a bill of goods, and they didn't deliver. And when they asked, why wasn't I healed? They're told, you haven't got enough faith. I turn around and I say to the preacher, where's your faith? Why don't you make them whole? Why don't you command it to go away? Why don't you work a miracle? Well, I'm not the healer. I don't do this. No, no. The Bible says that there are miracle workers in the body of Christ. Stop saying miracles are going to take place unless you're a miracle worker. Amen. If you have the gift of working miracles, miracles will happen. But if you don't have it, stop promising it. It's just a warning to people. That's, that's also an admonishment to others. Don't fall for these doctrines that promise you everything. Life is a bowl of cherries. But with the cherry, you get a pit. Amen? Yes, amen. If everybody got healed, then nobody would die. You'd be 495 years old, wheeled into the church. I don't want to die yet. Lay hands on me. All right, I got another 10 years now. That's not how it works. Death will come to everyone. Now, how it comes, it depends on how things are. I can't promise anything. All I know is this. You can pray, ask God to bless you and die in your sleep. Then I'll, I'll take that. That's fine. You know, I want, if that can happen. But I don't know, and I'm not concerned. You know why? Because I just want my death to glorify God. If I'm sick in the bed, and if I'm in a hospital, if I'm at home, I want to still be a witness and a light to others to let them know I may be leaving this place, but I'm not leaving it without having changed my life and changed the lives of others. I'm leaving a legacy behind, so I'm okay, you know? I'm okay. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, and let's close out today with this. Blessed be the God, verse 3, Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be our God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Total positional truth. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. The problem is this. They're in the heavenly places. I'm on the earth. I don't have access to them all the time. There are times where I get access to them. There are times when heaven comes to earth. There are times when I go to heaven in a sense. And there are times. But they're, but they're there, but they're not mine completely here. We have to understand that. And then he says, even as he chose us in the foundation of the world and then other things. Let's go down to verse 11 in whom also we have a heritage, being foreordained according to his purposes, who works all things after his own will, that we should be unto the praise of his glory, who have hoped in Christ. Those of us who have confidence in Christ are praising God and glorifying God. And then he says this, in whom also you, having heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also you believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you believe that he's your Savior? He's in you. Are you on fire? Are you lit today? Are you a candle? Are you on fire for God? Lord, I want to be a soul on fire. Amen? Amen. Then he says this, Then you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, Amen. which is the earnest, 
I like it better this way, which is the down payment on our inheritance. In other words, God has given you the Holy Spirit as the down payment of all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. This here, being lit, being alive, being born again Christian says, every spiritual blessing in heaven is yours one day. Some you'll get now, some you'll get later. You need to rightly divide the word of truth to understand what's for now, what's for later. If you don't know, ask. Lord, I'm sick. Looks like I'm not doing so well. I'd like to be healed. I know you can heal me. I'm asking you to do it. But whatever you do, I'm okay with it. I want to be a testimony no matter what. It's like the three young men thrown into the fiery furnace. If they were in the word of faith, they would have confessed they're not even in the furnace. But they were thrown in. And when they got thrown in, what were their last words? Our God can save us. Whether he will or whether he won't, it's up to him. But we're not going to bow down to you. And they threw them in. And God saved them. He decided to save them. Listen, many, many Christians were thrown into the lion's dens. Many Christians were persecuted and killed in the early church. Many Christians are being killed right now. In China, in different countries, in different Muslim countries, they're being slaughtered. In certain African countries, they're being herded into their churches and, their, and then they lock the doors and then they burn the church down. God didn't deliver them. Why? Their death becomes a testimony. The Bible says that Abel's blood still spoke even though he was dead. It says his blood cried out from the ground. Being dead, he still lives. Elijah's bones were in a, a tomb and when they, Elisha's bones, and when they had a dead soldier and they had to get, they had to bury him quick because they were losing a battle, they rolled a stone away, they threw him in, and when he hit Elijah, Elisha's bones, he came alive. Amen. Being dead, he still was alive in a sense. And God made a difference. But it doesn't happen to every single person. God is sovereign. He works his will according to his counsel. When it doesn't fit my agenda, what do I say? I don't like you, God. Well, you say that if you're a child. Isn't that right, mom and dad? Yes. When your kid says, I want this, and you say, you're not going to get it. I don't like you. When they get a little older, they say, I hate you. Right? And what do you do? Oh, honey, don't hate me. Here, take it. No, you don't do that. You say, go to your room. Think about what you just said. Or you give them a little something else to think about. <laughs> I got plenty of thinking about when I was a kid. Amen. So, beloved... Verse 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, powerful verse. Beloved, now we are the children of God. Now. Somebody say, I am, I am a child of God. Child right now. Right I'm now. born again. I'm alive. I'm alive. And every promise in the book belongs to me. I just might not get them today. He says, now we are the children of God, but it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Today, I'm an acorn. God willing, I'll grow into an oak tree. But if I don't, I'm satisfied that I'm an acorn because I'm alive in God. Amen? Amen. He says, but when he's revealed, we shall be like him. When he's revealed, when he comes back, those who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord will be translated, quickened in another way receiving celestial bodies and forever be with the Lord that way and usher him to the earth. And there's so much more to talk about with those things, but I can't. I just want to finish on this. You have been quickened by God. You are alive. You're called to become a king and a priest. Whether you make it or not, God willing, if he lets you and permits you, you'll move on towards perfection, maturity. If you're, pre if you're willing, that will help you move towards it. If you're not willing, you'll stay where you are. You'll still die and go to heaven. You're still God's child. He's not going to forsake you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to say, well, you know, you didn't go to church five times, so you're going, to, you're going to go to hell now. That's not what he does. But we want to work with God, cooperate with God, and let God work in our lives. Let's stand together in Jesus' name. Father, we've been quickened by the Holy Spirit. Lord, we're alive because of the Holy Spirit. Lord, every other person out in this world that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior personally, Lord, if they think about him, if they 
try to believe in him, they're still not born again. Lord, help us. Use us, Lord, to talk about Jesus, to talk about eternal life, to talk about these things. Lord, help us get over the fear of talking about our salvation. Help us to learn how to share our faith with others, Lord God, so that we can rejoice and be glad, knowing we've testified of you. We've lived our lives for you. We've glorified you in everything we can. We've shared our life, our love for you with others. And Lord God, we thank you that you saved us. Jesus, we can't thank you enough for taking the burden of sin upon yourself, for taking the cross upon yourself, for becoming sin for us, for believing in the impossible that the Father would raise you from the dead. But he did. And now you are going to raise us from the dead also. You've quickened us. You've given us great promises. And you've blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And Lord, we want to live our lives to glorify you. Help us glorify you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You are quickened. God bless you today. Amen.